Welcome to the Mobile Application Framework YouTube channel. My name is Juan Limpios and I'm from the Oracle Development Tools and Mobility Tools product management team. Normally when we do trainings we start with focusing on the product. We're not giving thoughts on the basic information about the technology that we use within the product. For the rest I want to do an exception and start this episode with giving you a brief overview of what REST is. First of all, REST is not a technology. Woo! It's not a technology. I say we use technologies. Well, it's based on a technology, but the technology is so old, it's just every um, principle that we use in the internet today just formalized into an architecture style, and that architecture style then is called representational state transfer or just RESTful or REST. You can choose whatever name you want. The RESTful service, unlike the SOAP service I covered in the previous episode, is less about procedures and methods and functions and collections about resources. Now everything is a resource. A bank account is a resource. A meal could be a resource. A database table could be a resource. And all that you do in REST is you focus on that resource and that resource allows you then to manipulate it, create it, update it, delete it, and this is what REST provides us help us for. Every resource in REST is identified by URI, by resource identification, or URL if you put the host name in front. We have that already, right? Exactly. Every page that you request on the internet follows that principle. It has a unique addressing within a specific namespace. And this is what REST actually formalizes into an architecture style. The payload of a REST service, and here's where the difference is to a SOAP service, can be XML but may not. Typically it's JSON, and we talk about JSON in a later episode where I give you more detailed information on what JSON really is and how it looks. However, beside of JSON, RESTful services might serve you binaries or they might serve you an image. Now this all is negotiated between the client who is accepting a specific format and the server who is willing to deliver a specific format. A server might be capable of delivering XML, JSON and images. The client, however, wants to have an image. So the client will tell the server what exactly they want. And the way to do that for the client is to use media type. In the past you might have heard the term MIME type. Now media types are encodings that tell the server what response format the client accepts, but also tells the server what is the encoded payload the client might send when updating a resource. So media types are important and there are two different types of media types. One are media types which are public, like the one listed here on the slide, application JSON or application XML, but then there also might be vendor specific uh, types which typically have the V and D abbreviation in the name. When we talk about REST, we talk about resources. I said that, but resources also might be different types and different kinds. So there's a document resource. So typically the naming convention that you use for that is a noun, like department, just to uh, symbolize a single department. Employee, just referencing a single employee to work with. And then of course you have collection of resources and they are then used within a plural noun. So like employees, departments, I don't know if you have banking accounts, but just in case you have many accounts within a bank, you might have banking accounts. And then, and I mentioned that when I talked about data controls, I said operations on RESTful services, that's nothing that really exists technically. However, semantically you can create that and this is created through verbs. So verbs are query parameters that you add to a URI. I could, for instance, say subscribe as a verb. Yeah, so the resource might be a specific magazine and then I put a query parameter subscribe, which is now also a verb, indicating not to update the resource because I'm not changing the magazine, but I change my status towards the magazine subscription. Yeah, so a verb could be exposed as an operation on a resource. And these three kind of things is what we typically deal with when we work with RESTful services. Now I mentioned the URI path and here's an example. So a typical URL which is unique is referenced by a host name, a port and there's an 
access path, the Java E path, for instance, or servlet path, as it's called. And then you do have another servlet information, which indicates if you're working in Java E, the servlet that uh, handles the REST um, request and followed by the resource name and then whatever you want to pass in addition. You can path, uh, pass a query parameters, and I mentioned that, or you can have URL parameters just put on top of that. And then the remote service will know how to um, interpret this request and replies with a specific response that hopefully then is expected by the client. So I talked about resources, I talked about REST, I talked about URIs, but how do I tell the server um, that I want to do an update on a resource? Do I use a verb? No. Here what I do is I use HTTP verbs and we all know about this, though mostly we use GET. Now everything that we query on the internet is a GET request. So give me that page is a GET me that page. right? Now everything I send to a REST service with a GET HTTP method actually will perform a query. So server side will be mapped to something that replies the response. At least the client wouldn't expect anything else than that, for instance, a state change. So GET requests never have a ch state change. I could issue 400 GET requests. They should never ever change the status of a resource. And then I have PUT. Now, PUT typically is used for creating a new object. However, as there is no strict rule to that, people also might use PUT for updating. Yeah. The other one used in this combination is POST. So usually you would say GET for read, put for create and post for update. But between put and post, there's no strict rule. So you might find everything there. And then there is another HTTP uh, method or verb, which is called patch. It's not as old as get, put and post, but patch allows you to just update parts of an object. So instead of just sending a post that updates the whole resource, including those bits that haven't changed, Patching allows you just to send the delta of the information that exists on the server and the changes applied to the client. And then we have delete, of course, where we can create resources. We need to be able to delete resources. And here we send a URL request, which uses the HTTP method delete. And then magically that will make the resource go away on the server. Well, there's some logic involved. The principle of REST is what we call hypermedia as the engine of application state. And here I need to go a bit into a little bit of discussion here. So what that really means is that every response to a request contains the subsequent response in it. So if I request a department as a resource and I display that, then the metadata I get from the server also will contain links that I could use to, for instance, drill down into the employees within that department. And this means there's a state that is delivered for my application and it's just encoded in the response. However, there's another option uh, which is called document template. Now, document template is what you find with SOAP services. So WSDL file is a very static file in the sense that once you work against that, you create an infrastructure and if the service changes, you will have to change the client. So you have a, a pretty much strong dependency between the structure of a service once you work against it and um, the client. REST is meant to be different in that a change on the server side should not require a change on the client side. However, as soon as you start to use document templates, we will make it easier for tools like MAF to identify uh, the structure of a service. As soon as you start doing that, then you create this dependency. When we have a RESTful service, we can test it in JDeveloper, in Eclipse as well. But in JDeveloper, we do have the HTTP analyzer. And I talked about the ability of a REST client to challenge the server for a specific payload. And this challenge of a specific payload format goes in that I can even have a whited request. I could say, well, if you have XML in store, send me XML. If not, I would expect or accept JSON as well. And this kind of information is passed with the request header. Now there is a header parameter called accept and this accept header, if I put this to application XML, it tells the server I want to have XML as a format. If I put application JSON, it will return JSON. If I put both but in a whited manner, 
then I could get one if the other is not available and so on. Another option is, because it's not a strict way of doing that, you could even make the payload part of your request URI. So I could have a request URI which is slash XML and then the resource name. It's just a matter of how the server-side implementation is. And here you see that because of, I wouldn't say the lack of formalism within REST, but the freedom of developing REST services, you have to understand what's in a service. So REST is pretty much dependent on you understanding the payload. And as we will see later, there is a document that is equivalent to WSDL, which is a battle doc document that describes the service, so you can get the information from it. However, to get information about a service and to learn how the service works, how the payload looks like, you can use the HTTP analyzer. On this screen that you see here, we have a uh, payload that is sent as a JSON payload. So you see the accept header has application as JSON, and we see the department collection as a JSON string. Now, if I pass XML, application XML, and if the server supports that, I get the same information as an XML infrastructure, and then I can work with it. Similar, if my service supported images, or if I could have an image uh, representation of a department, I could send application image, and it will return with an image. So that's basically how the RESTful services work. Error handling, well, everything in REST is web-based. I guess you already figured that during this episode here. Now, error handling has to follow the same path. And here we use HTTP error codes. You know some of the codes which are informational, like the 200 code, which indicates that the request went OK. There is a 304 uh, request which is forbidden, so obviously you're lacking uh, the privileges to access. And then there are different 400 codes which show that a resource is not available. Now, these kind of error codes are mapped on the server side to a REST service request and then returned back to the client. And the client actually will have to look into the return code and make sense out of these and respond so that the user hopefully doesn't see a blank screen. So this is how REST works from the error handling perspective. So how does MAF support REST? A lot of talk about RESTful basics and RESTful principles, and I'm definitely not the expert in REST here, so I hope at least I got the story so that you could understand it and you feel much better prepared for the next episodes I'm recording about REST. So the MAF support for REST, first of all, includes the REST XML support. So for every REST service that has an XML support, we have a REST data control. And for those who've seen the episode about data controls, uh, where I talked about SOAP data controls, you've seen that there is a radio button that allows you to switch between creating a data control for SOAP and REST. Now, if you switch it to REST, that is where the XML then gets into play. And then there is the support for REST with a JSON payload, which might be more interesting for you, because as I said, uh, REST with JSON, that seems to be um, what everyone is going after because of the simplicity or the lightweight behavior that JSON would provide as a payload. What you should know right now is that we're not limiting our support to JSON and XML because the REST data control also accepts other MIME types or media types to deal with. Thank <laughs> you.